Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, there is a further witness in relation to the first case study concerning fees for no service, and that is Ms. Perkovich from CBA. However, in terms of the structure this morning, Ms. Perkovich will be the third witness today. And for practical and thematic reasons, the next two witnesses will be witnesses from each of AMP and CBA that concern the second case study about platform fees. Yes, I see. The first witness that will be called in relation to platform fees is Mr Keating from AMP. Before Mr Keating is called, I want to say a little about why this case study has been selected for this module. Some of the largest financial services entities in Australia both provide financial advice to clients and also <coughs> manufacture products or financial products that are available for investment in or through by those clients. In January of this year, ASIC released Report 562, which arose from a project that ASIC conducted to understand how well these entities managed the conflict of interest that arose from having both of these functions, both providing advice and manufacturing the products. We have already referred to that Report 562 on Monday when the statements concerning vertical integration were tendered. The ASIC project focused on the five largest banking and financial services institutions in Australia, AMP Limited, ANZ, CBA, NAB and Westpac. ASIC sought information from the two largest advice licensees controlled or owned by each of these five institutions. One of the matters upon which ASIC focused was the proportion of funds invested by product type in external products as compared with internal products. Platforms had the highest proportion of total funds invested by all customers in in-house products. Across the 10 licensees, 91% of funds invested by customers in a platform were invested in an in-house platform during the period under review. For new customers, 96% of funds invested in a platform were invested in an in-house platform. When customers invest in a platform, they are charged an administration fee. Often that is a fee calculated as a percentage of the funds invested. The compounding effect of those fees over time may be significant. In this case study, we are going to explore some aspects of the potential conflicts in relation to the use of platforms. In particular, we will seek to assist you to understand the decision-making process by which a financial planner recommends a platform, the role of the platforms in facilitating the charging of ongoing service fees, and the commissions and revenue sharing arrangements that exist in relation to the platforms, including how those commissions and arrangements intersect with the FOFO grandfathering provisions. Commission that, Commissioner, that's all I wanted to say in opening, and now the first witness in relation to this case study will be Mr Keating. Yes, it's Mr Keating in the room. If you'd come into the witness box, please, Mr Keating. Now, Mr Keating, would you prefer to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation? An oath, please. Yes, perhaps if you stand up then while the oath is administered. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Keating. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Hollow. Um, your full name is John Patrick Keating. Yes. And your business address is 750 Collins Street, Melbourne. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and you are presently head of. Pla uh, platform products at AMP. Yes, I am. And uh, do you have with you in the witness box the summons issued to you by the Royal Commission to give evidence? I do. I attend to the summons. Exhibit 2.68, summons to Mr Keating. Mr Keating, you have prepared a statement in response to certain questions asked by the Commission, is that correct? Yes, I have. And it's styled uh, rubric 226. Yes, it is. And you have that statement with you uh, in the witness box? Yes, I do. 
And you also have some exhibits in the folders that are in front of you. Is yes, that right? Three folders. Um, and those exhibits um, are the exhibits to the statement that I've just referred to. Yes, they are. And I may interpolate, Mr. Commissioner. Mr. Um, Mr. Keating has uh, the exhibits to his statement other than the exhibits in tabs 6 and 12. The reason for that is that they are very voluminous. And You're going to give me a single sheet of A4 giving me a summary of them, are you, uh, Mr. Hollow? <laughs> yeah. By 5 o'clock tonight, I'll do it. <laughs> um, 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 uh, I tend to the statement and the exhibits and uh, Mr. Commissioner, and, and also the exhibits. Um, Exhibit 2.69 will be the statement of Mr. Keating with exhibits. Mr. Keating, are you satisfied the contents of your statement are true and correct? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hollow. Yes, Mr. Hollow. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Keating, you're the witness that has been presented by AMP to respond to a series of questions that the Commission has asked in relation to platforms? Yes, that's correct. And as you've already indicated, you're the head of platform products? Yes, I am. And you explain at paragraph six of your statement that the team that you head, the platform products team, is responsible for a number of things. The first is platform product strategy for retail superannuation and investments platforms. What does that mean? That's, uh, again, the product design and the product set that we have and making sure that that's fit for purpose in terms of our, uh, our customers. And the second is the development and management of AMP platform products which you define as investor-directed portfolio services, IDPS-like schemes and superannuation funds. Can we just break that down? What is an investor-directed portfolio service? So that is a non-superannuation investment product in the name of the individual customer. And would that be... Sorry, Mr Keating, you're going to have to keep your voice up a bit further. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. So... That would be something like a wrap platform available to any investor rather than somebody investing in superannuation? That is one of the product types that's available on a wrap platform. So there's also uh, a superannuation product option and a pension product option as well as the IDPS product type. And again, I just want to make sure we distinguish between these different types of products. The non-superannuation, non-pension products. Is that what's referred to as an IDPS product? Yes, that's correct. And a RAP platform might be an IDPS product? Yes. Could a RAP platform also be form part of a superannuation product or a pension product? Yes, it can. Okay. And then the second type of product you refer to is an IDPS-like scheme. Can you explain what that is? Uh, similar, again, it's a non-superannuation investment product in the name of the customer. Um, similar in all respects, other than the, the, the legal structure, which is, as it's described, IDPS like, very similar. All right, and perhaps if you, again, just explain for the Commissioner, in the way that AMP distinguishes between these things, what's the distinction in legal structure between an IDPS and an IDPS-like scheme? Uh, effectively, in all... You know, in, in basic terms, I think they're, they're very, very similar. Um, one is uh, run by an operator, which is the IDPS, and an IDPS-like scheme is run by a responsible entity, but again, uh, they're AMP entities. All right. And then the third type of product is a superannuation fund? Yes, that's correct. And does the description superannuation fund embrace a master trust type scheme? A superannuation fund uh, can have a uh, master trust products so uh, as right. part of that super fund. And so in terms of what your team does, each of these types of platforms that are, oper that are offered by AMP is something that would be developed and managed by your team? Yes, that's correct. Right. And would your team also determine the pricing that applies yes, to these do. platforms? And then you also refer in paragraph 6D to managing AMP's relationships with third-party platform providers. 
Can you just explain what that means? So for some of our platform products, we outsource elements of the, of the proposition. So by that I mean uh, Asgard Capital Management is one of those groups where we outsource effectively the technology and administration that is part of that offering. And I want to just focus on that for a moment to understand the nature of the relationship. There's a product that AMP offers which is called Portfolio Care. Yes, that's correct. There might actually be a few variations of Portfolio Care, are there? Yes, there are. There's three. Three, did you say? And one of those variations is a Portfolio Care wrap service, is that? Yes, that's the Portfolio Care e-wrap right. product. And is that something that is outsourced or is that something that's done entirely in-house? So um, AMP uh, is the superannuation trustee. AMP retains the operator status of the, the non-super aspect of that product. What we outsource is the administration services and the technology that the products sit on to Asgard. So Asgard develops the product, the technology for you? Yes, they do. And they maintain it? Yes, they do. But they don't set the fee that's charged for it? No, we're in control of that. Okay. And is Asgard related to BT? Yes, they're part of the BT financial group. All right. And so you have some arrangement where you pay B, well, pay Asgard for undertaking the development in relation to that platform, is that right? Yes, that's correct. All right. And if, you, if we then go over to paragraph nine of your statement, which is page three, thank you. So you set out here the various products that fall within these three types of categories, one IDPSs, one IDPS-like schemes, and one superannuation. In relation to the IDPSs, how many of those that are listed there are currently open for new investment? There is five of those products. All right. So, so which are the ones that so aren't open for new investment uh, North Investment is closed to new business. North Investment, yes. And the Wealth View ERAP investment is also closed to new business. All right, and were they closed for new business in 2016? Yes, they were. Okay. And then if we go to paragraphs 14 and 15 of your statement. You explain there some aspects of the nature of the RAP platform arrangement. And I want to take you through that, but I want to make sure that we're doing it by reference to some specific products so that we make sure we're talking about the same thing. The Wealthview eRAP investment, that was a, a pure RAP platform, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And the Portfolio Care eRAP investment, that's also a pure RAP platform? Yes, it is. Okay. And are all of the other IDPSs that we saw listed in 9A also pure RAP platforms? Yes, they are. Okay. And the way in which the RAP platform works is, as a starting point, the investor places money into the RAP platform in some way? Yes, that's correct. And then the money is then invested into various products that are available through the RAP platform? Yes, that's right. And the, there's an approved products and services list, is that right? Yes, there is. And the approved products and services list will set out products that are approved for availability through the RAP platform? Yes, that's correct. Is it possible through the RAP platform to invest in products that aren't on the approved products and services list? No, it's not. Okay. So if an investor or client came to an AMP financial planner 
and wish to invest in a product outside of the approved products and services list, they couldn't go on to an AMP RAP platform. In that case, uh, an advisor could seek an exemption to use a non -AP, a, a platform product that's not on the APL. So they would. But could it be invested in through the platform, or would it need to be invested in outside of the platform? Uh, outside of the platform. Right. And where an investor's money is invested in a product through the platform, who is the legal owner of the investment? Depending on if it's a, an IDPS or an IDPS-like product, it's the individual customer. All right. And so, again, just so I understand, you see in paragraph 14 where you say, you refer to title in those investments is owned by the RAP operator or its custodian on behalf of the investor. What does that mean? Effectively, they're... Um, so in the case of the, the, the superannuation or pension product, they are uh, in the name of the superannuation trustee. Um, in terms of administering that portfolio, that's done by the um, RAP operator um, and with services from a custodian as well in terms of placing money in investment products and taking money out of investment products. But let's for a moment focus on it outside of the context of superannuation. If a client comes to an AMP financial advisor and wants to invest $100,000 in a range of investments, and that $100,000 is placed into, say, the portfolio care platform, and then in turn that $100,000 is invested in various funds that are available through the platform, who is the owner of the interest in those funds? The beneficial owner is the customer, ultimately. I see. So the, in the title is owned by the RAP operator, but it's held on trust for the particular investor. Is that right? Yes, in an individual account in that investor or customer's name. All right. And if an investor wants to move RAP platforms, is it possible to move RAP platforms without selling out of the fund that their money has been invested into? Yes, it is. Is that possible regardless of whether it's an AMP platform that they wish to move to or somebody else's platform? Yes, that's correct. All right. So I'll just make sure we've understood this accurately. If, for example, a client was invested in the Wealthview platform that's now been, or invested through the Wealthview platform in, say, the Platinum International Fund, and they wished to move over to the Portfolio Care platform, which is also an AMP platform, then they could do so without having to first sell out of their interest in the Platinum Fund. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Through I'm sorry, you were going to say how? Is that yes, right? so they can move through the, uh, an in-species transfer process where they retain beneficial ownership. And in that way, does that avoid triggering a capital gains tax event? That's right. There's no buy or sell event associated with that transfer. And similarly, if an investor was invested in the Wealthview platform and wished to move from the Wealthview platform to a platform operated by Colonial, say the Colonial First Wrap plus investment platform, they could also do that by an in-specie transfer, is that right? Yes, they can if the platform offers the in-specie transfer feature. If, if the incoming platform offers the in-specie uh, transfer. It's both on the outgoing platform as well as the, the platform where the funds are going to in terms of accepting an in-specie transfer in. All right. Well, in the case of AMP's platforms, does it offer in-specie transfer for all outgoing transfers? to external products? Not for all platform products, no. Which are the platform products that it won't offer in specie transfer for to external products? I believe one of those is the Portfolio Care Master Trust product. All right, but if they were, again, we'll take the example of Wealthview. 
for wealth view, which is now closed to new investments, if an existing investor wants to transfer out of that to an external platform, is there anything on the AMP end that prohibits that occurring on an in-specie basis? I'd have to refer to some detail in terms of for that particular product, if the in-specie transfer out is, is a feature that's available. Right. And, and why is in-specie transfer not available on all products? Um, it's just it's a feature that's um, been developed over time and, and is available on um, a number of the platforms, but for historical reasons, and some of those platforms have been around for some time, um, and species transfer functionality wasn't available. So it's just a technological issue? Is yes, that right? it is, yeah. And the technology has been applied to some platforms, but not to other platforms? Yes, that's correct. And is there some difficulty with retrofitting existing platforms with the technology? Not necessarily, no. It's just a case of um, building that functionality. But the functionality is presumably already built, isn't it? If it already exists for some platforms. It does, that's right, replicating existing functionality on other platforms. And has there been any consideration given to whether that functionality should be extended to all platforms operated by AMP? Uh, I'd say yes, in, in looking at the design of those products when the products were designed, and then over time as we review products and, and the features that are available from time to time. So we do consider that. And I'm sorry, I may have confused you then. This functionality, are we only talking about the functionality of transferring to an external platform operator? Yes, we are. So that the functionality for transferring to an internal platform operator already exists? No, it's the same concept in terms of the in-specie transfer function. All right. And so the consequence of that then is that if you're on a platform that is charging higher fees but doesn't permit in-specie transfer, you can't move to another platform, whether internal or external, without triggering a capital gains tax event. Yes, that's correct. In particular, as beneficiary, you can't call for the asset which is held on trust for you. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. An unusual form of trust, I would have thought. But the beneficiary can't call for the asset. Is that the position? So the beneficiary, the owner of that asset. The beneficial owner cannot call for the asset that uh, uh, you say, AMP or the relevant platform, holds on trust for that beneficiary. No, in order to move, they would need to sell that asset. Now, I want to ask you some questions about the charging of fees. Each of the platforms charges a fee to the client who's invested through the platform? Yes, that's correct. And in some cases, that fee is calculated by reference to a percentage of the funds invested through the platform? Yes, it is. Are there any platforms that AMP operates that don't charge by reference to a percentage of the funds invested? No, there's not. Okay. So all platforms that AMP operates are charging a percentage of funds? Yes. And the percentage of funds that's charged will vary depending upon which platform it is? Yes, it will. And again, just because of the difference in terminology, can I make sure that if we go back to paragraph nine, uh, paragraph nine of your statement where you set out IDPSs, IDPS-like schemes and superannuation. Is the statement that all platforms charge a percentage of the fees invested through the platform applicable to every product listed here? Yes, it is. Okay. And for superannuation products, is the percentage typically lower than for the non-superannuation products? It's quite similar. I see. So that is the MyNorth super and pension 
platform would charge a, a similar percentage to the My North investment platform. So that's correct, yes. Okay. And does the percentage apply both to the cash balance that is held through the platform and also the invested funds? On some platforms it does, yes. Okay, but on some platforms it doesn't apply to the cash balance. That's right. And how is, how is the decision made as to which platforms would charge the percentage on the cash balance? Again, I think it's a decision made when the product's designed as to how the admin fees will be applied and whether they'll be applied to the cash account. And it could presumably be changed easily now? Yes, it can be. And is there any reason why, for some platforms, AMP continues to charge a percentage of the cash balance? Again, that would just be existing product design and product features um, of that particular, the particular platform. Is there interest that is payable on the cash balance held through the platform? Yes, there is. And is the interest rate standard across the cash balances through all platforms? Is that all platform, all AMP platforms? Yes. Um, no, there will be some variation across platforms. Okay. But in any event, at the moment, is it possible, for example, that you could be paying 0.77% as a administration fee on a cash balance and then earning, say, 2% as an interest rate on the cash balance? Yes, that's correct. And then on top of that, could you also be being charged an advisor service fee with respect to that cash balance? Uh, yes, an advisor service fee on the, the, the total account balance, yes, which includes that. And when AMP deducts fees for advice, it's doing so, as I understand it, on the instructions of the investor? Yes, it is. It requires the investor to sign some form that's submitted to AMP to give instructions to allow that to be deducted? Yes, that's correct. And that fee will, ex I'm sorry, that form will set out different options as to how the fee might be calculated? Yes, that's correct. And it might be that it's described as just a flat fee? Uh, yes, it can be. But more commonly, the option that would be ticked is a percentage fee? Yes, that's correct. Is there an option to apply the percentage only to funds invested rather than to the cash, rather than also to the cash balance? Typically no, so it's across the account balance. So then once that form is submitted, AMP's system will automatically deduct that fee if it's on a monthly basis every month? Yes, it will. It will. I'm sorry, I should go back a step. The form will also identify what the interim period is between each deduction for the advice fee? Yes, it does. And the system will just automatically deduct it according to the boxes that are ticked and the amount identified? That's correct, typically monthly or quarterly. And AMP <coughs> imposes a cap on the amount of the advice fee? Yes, we do, and that cap is based on the account balance. So I'm sorry, I don't understand that. What do you so, mean? So the caps that we apply on platform products around advice fees, there are um, some caps that are related to the balance of the customer's account. So, I'm sorry, we might be at cross purposes here. Are you talking about the cap for the advice fee or the cap for the administration fee? No cap for the advice fee. I see. So if, for example, a client has $250,000 invested through a platform, will there be some cap that applies as to how much the advisor can deduct as an advice fee? Yes, there is. And does that vary depending upon the platform? Uh, yes, I think there'll be some variation. And what is... Well, do you know, I know you've got some spreadsheets which we can go to if that will help you, but do you know what the typical cap is that's applied? 
if I use the My North platform product as an example, yes. um, the cap for a customer with $250,000, the cap on advice fees would be approximately $5,250 and a percentage up to 2.51%. And that applies regardless of what the balance is? That's just the overall cap? Yes. Okay. So when you were making the point that it's linked to the balance, is that because there's a, the absolute amount of the fee is capped by virtue of the fact that you can only charge a maximum percentage as against whatever the current funds are in the platform? The, I was referring to lower balances. So on a, for instance, again, the My North platform product, if the account balance is under $1,500, which is quite a small amount, you can't charge an advice fee. If the balance is between $1,500 and $10,000, the cap on the advice fee is 2.51%. And then lastly, everything above $10,000 is as per the cap that I just explained. $5,250. $5, plus the percentage amount. Oh, I'm sorry, $5,250 plus the percentage of 2.51%. Yes, up to 2.51%. I see. And were you involved in the decision by AMP to implement that technological cap on the maximum fees? No, I wasn't, personally. Was that a cap that applied before you joined the team? Yes, that's correct. There have been new products that have been developed while you've been a member of the team? No, the most recent new product is the My North product, and that was 2016. Oh, I see. You weren't even a member of the team at all before you became the head? Uh, the I, I was a member of the team at that time, yes. But In 2016? Yes. Okay. So when you were a member of the team and that product was developed, did you participate in a discussion about what the cap would be f for the advice fees? No, I did not. Okay. Are you aware of how the cap was arrived at? Not in any, any real detail other than that I know the cap has been approved by um, the superannuation trustee and the, and the operator of the, <coughs> the platform in, in the case of My North. I see. Now, when it comes to the advice fees, as I think we've already agreed, the platform is automatically deducting the fee from the members' funds available? Yes, it is. And if there's insufficient cash available in the cash balance to pay the fee, what occurs? Uh, there is a sell down of invested assets um, to top up the cash balance to cover those fees. So the platform does that automatically? Yes, it does. There's no need for the advisor to give instructions for that to occur? Uh, the advisor can um, provide automated or regular instructions um, in terms of what assets to sell down to top up cash. So there are some settings there that the advisor can um, set, uh, they're known as uh, sell instructions. But regardless of whether the advisor has done that, the platform will automatically sell down in order to make sufficient cash available to pay the fees? Yes, it will. And that will occur both to pay the administration fee, if there's insufficient cash to pay the administration fee? Yes, that's correct. And it will also happen if there's insufficient cash to pay the advice fee? Yes. Okay. And you're aware, I assume, that since 2013 there have been legal obligations on financial planners to have clients opt in to continuing to pay advice fees? Yes, I'm aware of that. And since 2013, has AMP taken any steps to develop the technological capacity within its platform to only pay fee, to only remit the fees to the planner or the licensee if the client has opted in to continue to pay fees? No, we haven't. And why is that? The, as I say, the, the platform collects the fees um, as per the agreement between advisor and customer and passes those fees on to the advice licensee. Um, and the controls in terms of um, services for those fees uh, are managed through the advice licensee. 
So the advice licensee or the planner? The advice licensee. I see. And I just want to make sure that I've understood how this fits together. So there's a form that gets submitted that's been signed by the client and it will have agreed to some fee being deducted. That's the first step, is that yes, right? Yes, it is. And then in accordance with that signed instruction, the platform will automatically deduct the fee each month or each quarter and remit that amount to the relevant licensee? Yes, that's correct. And then what is the control that the licensee has over whether the fee continues to be deducted? So the, the control that I was referring to is the uh, audit and compliance team within the licensee um, looks at those fees that have, have been passed over from the platform to the licensee and then um, audits advisors to check that services have been provided for those fees. I see. And then it would be possible for either the relevant planner or the licensee to turn off the deduction of those fees, is that right? Yes, a request to turn off those fees could come from three places. It could come from the customer themselves, it could come from the advisor, or it could come from the licensee. If the customer requested to turn off the fees, what would happen? They would typically contact, contact us by phone through the, the call centre, um, and then that request would be action through the operations team <coughs> to turn off the fees. And if the advisor fees are turned off, is there any change to any other fees? No, there's not. Okay. So the management fee that's charged, oh, I'm sorry, the administration fee that's charged by the platform operator stays the same regardless of whether there's an advisor linked to the product or not? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And is there any technological reason why AMP couldn't require advisors to confirm every two years that their clients had opted in to continue to pay the fees? That's certainly possible to do, yes. Has there been any consideration given while you have been the head of the team to implementing such a technological solution? I think that's certainly a key theme when we think about platform development in the future is the integration between the platform and, and advice processes and, and, and how to best do that. Or was that something that was already in consideration when you became the head of the platform? Uh, yes, but there's different aspects of, um, of that. What does that mean? What are the different aspects so, of it? So one example is today the uh, platform provides data feeds from the platform to financial planning tools that advisors use. So that would be an area where we, you know, we have uh, that integration in place and we, we manage and we develop that. And I guess I'm talking about uh, in future an extension of the, the level of integration between platform and advice processes. But is, there's no reason, is there, why AMP couldn't automatically turn off the advice fees every two years unless the advisor had confirmed <coughs> that the client had opted in and submitted a copy of the opt-in notice? Yes, that's, that's possible to, to put in place. And is that something that, that particular approach, is that something that AMP has considered? Uh, not to my knowledge, not, not. And is there any reason for that? Failure to consider that? Not that, not that I'm aware of other than there's controls in place uh, that are off, that are separate from the platform. Um, well, the controls in place, as I understand, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Did you want to finish? Saying something. No, I was just saying, no, other than there are those controls that I mentioned, they're in place that are off the platform, if I could describe it that way. But the controls in place are that the licensee might audit the advisor, discover that no services are being provided, and then contact the platform in order to tell the platform to turn off the advice fees. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Is there any other control in place? No. And do you know how often, since you've been the head of the product team, that has occurred, that an advice licensee has contacted the platform to tell them to turn off the advice fees? No, I'm, I'm not aware of the, the volume or frequency. 
But okay. Do you know whether it's happened at all? I understand, yes, there have been requests that should go through the, the operations team. I seem to do that. And if your team was to consider implementing such a technological change to require advisors to confirm that the clients had opted in to continue to pay fees, is that something that you could simply implement without the approval of other people within AMP? We would typically um, engage um, business stakeholders that are involved in, in, in the process and the reasons, you know, the basis for that platform development. So we would be um, engaging the stakeholders across the business before we did that. And has there been any discussion amongst stakeholders as to technological controls that might be implemented within the platform to ensure that advisors have had their clients opt in to continue paying fees? Not that I'm, not that I'm aware of. As the head of the platform team, is it a matter of concern to you that AMP's platforms are automatically deducting the fees and paying them to the licensees without confirming that the legislative requirements for those fees to be deducted have been complied with? I wouldn't say it's a matter of concern. I, I would say that the arrangement is between the advisor and client around the, the advisor fees and the services for those fees. So, um, and yes, the platform provides um, the collection mechanism for, for passing those fees across to the licensee. Yes, and as the provider of the collection mechanism, is it a matter of concern to you that no steps are taken to ensure that the legislative requirements for the deduction of those fees have been complied with? Well, again, I, I would look to the existing controls that are in the advice uh, audit and compliance team. All right. The expression collection mechanism itself is uh an interesting characterisation. Whose assets are you holding? Well, ultimately, it's the individual customer's assets. You're disposing of the uh, individual customer's assets when you pay the fee, is that right? Yes, if the cash account balance is, uh, if there's not enough uh, funds in the Whether cash Whether or account. not cash is available or has to be realised, you are disposing of the customer's assets, is that right? Yes, that's correct. You do that without uh, any assurance to the platform operator that the disposition is uh, permitted? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, I was going to move to another topic. Yes. Unless, thank you. <coughs> now, Mr Keating, you've given some evidence in your statement about benchmarking of platforms. Yes, I have. And is that benchmarking something that's undertaken by your team? No, it's not. So there's some other team within AMP that undertakes that benchmarking? Yes, that's the advice research team in the advice business. But I assume you've looked at it, you've exhibited it, their benchmarking yes, guidelines? Yes, I Okay. And as I understand it, the way in which the benchmarking guidelines work is to attempt to benchmark AMP products against similar products on the market, is that right? Yes, that's correct. In order to establish whether the products offered by AMP are competitive or not? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Can I... And sorry, just before I do that, I should confirm you've exhibited a number of different benchmarking guidelines. As I understand it, there are separate benchmarking guidelines for each of AMP Financial Planning, Charter Financial Planning, Hillross Financial Services and IPAC Securities. Is that right? Yes, there are. But the... They appear to be very similar. Yes, they are very similar. It, and the products that are being offered may differ slightly between uh, each of those four licensees. Yes, there, is, there are some differences. But insofar as they're offering the same product, for example, 
if all of them are offering the Wealthview ERAP product, is there any reason why that product would be rated higher or differently when it's being offered through AMP financial planning than when it's being offered through one of the other licensees? No, I don't, don't see any reason why. It should be all the same. You charge the same administration fee, for example, regardless of which licensee uses it. Yes, that's correct. All right. So can we have a look at the benchmarking guidelines for AMP financial planning as an example? Can we bring up tab seven of Mr Keating's, of the exhibits to Mr Keating's affidavit? St I'm sorry, statement. Got a doc ID. Yes, it's AMP.6000.0043.0379. So this is version one of the AMP financial planning benchmarking guidelines, Mr Keating? Yes, it is. And it's not dated on the front, but if we go to page two, which is .0380, you see down the bottom of the page, this is the version from 2013. Yes, I can see that. And this was, well, presumably then this benchmarking first occurred in 2013. Yes, I believe so. And do you know why the benchmarking began in 2013? Uh, no, I don't. Was it to comply with the best interests or to enable the financial planners to comply with their best interests duty? Uh, yes, it was actually in terms of their duties around personal advice. All right. And <coughs> if we then go to page seven of that, I'm sorry, page nine of that document. So this is a chart that sets out the colour coding by which benchmarking of products has occurred. You see that? Yes, I can see that. And as I understand it, the colour coding reflects how competitive the product is by price compared to comparable products in the market. Uh, yes, compared to an average of the set of platforms that are being considered. Yes. And so if a product is rated, I'll say bright green, tier one, then the product is competitive on price alone for the client at the relevant price point? Yes, it is. And if a product is rated tier two, which is light green, then the product is described as being competitive on price alone based on the particular threshold, which is the price is, there's no more than a 10% difference to the average price or a $100 per annum difference to the average price. Yes, that's correct. And if a product is rated yellow tier three, then that means the price difference is greater than 10% but less than 15% compared to the average price for the AMP product. Yes, that's correct. And they, the advisor guidance for that is the product is generally not competitive on price alone at the relevant price point. Yes, that's correct. And there's certain recommendations as to what the advisor ought to do if a client is using that product. Yes, there are. And then if a product is rated red which is, or tier four, then that means the product difference is greater than 15% for the AMP product compared to the average price? Yes, that's correct. And in which case the advisor guidance is the product is not competitive on price alone at the relevant price point. And there's a whole series of steps that the advisor ought to take if the client is invested in that product. Yes, that's correct. And can we go then to page 14 of that document? So this is one of the 
benchmarking pages as at 2013. Before we come to the colour coding, can you just explain to the Commissioner what a Category 1 pricing analysis is? Category 1 refers to a, a client or a customer with more complex needs in terms of their investment portfolio. All right. And the assumption is that for more complex needs, they might need additional functionality, is that right? Yes, or a broader range of investment choice, as well as features and functionality. Okay. And so, if there's a comparison of an AMP product in Category 1, it would be compared to other products on the market that also offer that sort of greater range of flexibility or options or functionality, is that right? Yes, that's right. And there's then, I assume you know and we'll come to this in a moment, but there's two different ways that the pricing analysis is done or for two different types of investments. One is the full range of investments, which is what we're looking at here. Yes. And the other is what's described as single diversified multi-sector solution. Yes. And can you just explain the difference between those two things? So the, the latter would be a, a simple multi-manager fund um, that the client might be invested in. And that's typically available on all of our, that type of investments available on all of our platforms and, and in the marketplace. And maybe if I attempt to flesh that out and see if you agree, that would mean, for example, it might be invested in a platinum fund, it might be invested in a rare fund, it might be invested in a perpetual fund spread across different types of funds, is that right? It might be invested um, with different fund managers, yes. such as the ones you've named, yes. That, that's a single diversified multi-sector solution, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And whereas a full range of investments would extend outside of just multiple different fund managers? Uh, again, it'd be different types of um, managed funds, for instance, in, t um, uh, in terms of the broad range that's available on the, on the full menu, the full investment menu for the platform. All right. And that might be, for example, investing in listed securities? Yes, it could include that. Okay. And we can see that as at 2013, for the Wealthview ERAP platform, that it was rated red by AMP's benchmarking analysis if there was an investment of either $50,000, $100,000 or $250,000 through the platform? Yes, I can say that. And if there was an investment, and sorry, that's for the full range of investments? Yes, under category one, that's correct. And if there was an investment through portfolio care, then it was rated red at the $100,000 amount of investment, yellow for investments at $500,000, $750,000 and $1 million, and then red for $1.5 million? Yes, that's correct. And then if we go over to page 16, which is dot zero three nine four, we can see again that for Wealthview, it's rated red at $50,000 and $100,000 and yellow at $250,000. Yes. And for portfolio care, it's rated yellow at $50,000 and red for everything else. Yes, it is. And if we go to I'm sorry, I don't think 
you tell me if you're, oh no, it does come here. If we go to page 30. So this sets out for category one, what the products have been benchmarked against. Yes, it does. All right. And now can we bring up what is the last tab of tab two of the exhibits to Mr. Keating's statement? I believe the document number should be 6000.0065.0111. Should be a spreadsheet. go to the very last tab, which should be tab 15. Thank you, table of clients. And can we scroll down, keep scrolling, all right, and just stop, no, no go, thank you, go up slightly, a little more, <laughs> a little more, thank you. And then can we blow up? Very the scientific, Mr. <laughs> yes, Commissioner. <laughs> Can we blow up rows 35 through to 57? Thank you. So, one of the things that the Commission asked you to do, or asked AMP to do, Mr. Keating, was to break down the number of clients from affiliated advisors and un unaffiliated advisors invested at various platforms in various years at various price points, is that right? Yes. And this is the spreadsheet that you've produced? Yes, it is. And if we look at the portfolio care ERAP number, to begin with, we can see in 2013 there were over four and a half thousand clients invested in portfolio care ERAP. You see that? No, I can't at the moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We've. You'll need to go over a little more to the left. Thank you. There you go. Four hundred, four and a half thousand, four thousand five hundred seventy-two. Yes, I can see that. All right, and that's the total number of clients. And then down at Wealthview, the total number of clients invested is 2,401, you can see yes, that? I can see that. And the split of those 2,401 for Wealthview <coughs> is 2,305 from affiliated advisors and 96 from unaffiliated advisors. Yes, it is. And so roughly speaking, it would seem that about 96% of the clients invested in the Wealthview product are invested by affiliated advisors. Yes, they are. And that appears to hold true for each subsequent year, 2014 through to 2017. Yes, it does. And is this data that has been provided by the platform operator to the auditing section of AMP? Not that I'm aware of, no. All right. Have, are you aware of any request by the auditing section of AMP for this type of data? No. With the example of Wealthview, that's um, on the APL for AMP financial planning. So it was only on the AMP financial planning APL, I, I believe. Right. So therefore, it, that, that is the group using it, so that number would be AMP financial planners from that licensee. Sorry, you're, you're saying all of the affiliated advisor clients would be coming from AMP financial planning? Just using Wealthview as an example. For Wealthview. That they would be AMP financial planners. And has AMP financial planning requested this type of data from your section 
so far as you're aware? No. All right. And you'll recall for the benchmarking exercise that Wealthview was rated red for clients at $50,000, $100,000, and $250,000. Do you want to bring that back up? Uh, based on what I saw before, I agree with what I saw earlier. So if that's consistent, yes. And is there a reason that you can think of why a financial planner would recommend a client invest through a platform rated red in that way? There may be exceptions why um, there would be a valid reason for a, for a client to be invested in the platform. Um, that may relate to um, a unique feature that platform may have. It may be a case of uh, specific um, fee features as well, so things like um, on some of our platforms, as an example, we have family fee aggregation. So if there are other members of a, of a family group that are already customers on that platform, that it may mean a new customer, so that let's say the son of somebody, that they um, there are, the fees are cheaper for them. So that would be a, something that isn't contemplated in the, in the benchmarking that we see before us. So in the case of Wealthview, does it offer some unique feature? Not that I'm aware of, no. Does it offer family fee discounts? I would have to check on that in terms of fee aggregation features. All right. And I assume you're aware that the benchmarking of Wealthview gets worse over time? Yes, I am. And so that was 2013. Can we go back to tab seven? I'm sorry, tab, yes, tab seven of Mr. Keating's statement. And if we go to the page amp.6000.0043.1077, Thank you. So you see this is version four from April 2015. If we, I'm sorry, if you just zoom out so Mr Keating can see the bottom of the page. And you see, you can see that Mr Keating? Yes, I can see that date. And so by April 2015, both Wealthview and Portfolio Care Service are rated Read at every bench at every price point benchmarked by the relevant AMP team. Yes, I can see that. And if we go to pay, and I'm sorry, I should indicate that's for the category one full range of investments. You can see that at the top of the page. Yes, I can see that. If we go to page 16 of that document, which is dot one zero seven nine. We can see for that single diversified multi-sector solution that the Wealthview product is only rated yellow at a million dollars and 1.5 million dollars, but is still rated red at every other price point. Yes, I can see that. And portfolio care is rated red at every price point. Yes, it is. And then... <coughs> If we then go through to the last benchmarking guideline that we've been provided with, which is October 2016, and go to amp.6000.0043.1937. So you'll see, you can see at the bottom of the page, Mr Keating, this is version 8.1. October 2016. 
Yes, I can see that date. And again, portfolio care, it's now called super service. Is that different from the previous one we were looking at? No, it's the same portfolio care service I think it was referred to earlier. And it's rated red at every price point? Yes, it is. And Wealthview is rated red at $50,000, $100,000, $250,000, $500,000 and $750,000? Yes, it is. And then yellow at $1 million and $1.5 million? Yes, that's correct. And then if we go over the page to .1939, We can see using the different single diversified multi-sector solution, portfolio care is still rated red at every price point. Yes, it is. And Wealthview is rated red at $50,000, $100,000, $250,000 and $500,000. Yes, it is. And rated yellow at $750,000. Yes but green at $1 million and $1.5 million? Yes, it is. Well, I'm sorry, that, that's actually light green. That means, as I understand it, a less than 10% difference to the average price. That's right, tier two. So it's, it appears, as I read it, that it's at $1 million still 7% more expensive than the average, bench, that the average competing product. Yes, that's correct. And at $1.5 million, still 5% more expensive than the average competing product. Yes. And I should have asked you earlier, but I didn't. Portfolio care service or portfolio care super service, does that platform offer any unique feature? Not that I'm aware of, no. All right. And those two platforms were then in 2016 placed on hold? Yes, that's correct. And can you just explain what that means? So I, I understand that to mean that um, advisors can't simply place customers, new customers into those products without first um, seeking permission from the research team who manage the APL. Right. It continues to be the case that there are clients of AMP affiliated advisors invested in those products? Yes, there are. And perhaps if we just go back to that tab we were looking at, which is AMP.6000.0065.0111. And we can see for Wealthview, the number has fallen as at 2017 to 1,332 clients invested through that platform. Yes, I can see that. But of that, only 46 are from unaffiliated advisors. Yes, that's correct. And 1,286 are from affiliated advisors. Yes. I take it, and this follows, I think, from a question I asked you earlier, AMP Financial Planning hasn't asked you for the names of the financial planners that are still investing clients through Wealthview? No, that hasn't been requested. Is there any practical reason why those clients couldn't be moved to a better performing platform? No, there's no practical reasons why they couldn't be moved. That There are practical reasons why they might stay in the product. And what are so, they? So one example would be clients who are in uh, pensions, and there have been changes, I think, in early 2015 around the deeming rules that Centrelink apply. So that's a consideration in terms of moving out of that pension product and what bearing it might have on their Centrelink benefits. 
So um, that is, in some cases, it, it, it's more appropriate for the customer to stay in the product. So that would be one example. Are there any other examples you can think of? Potentially the other examples would be um, the insurance arrangements on the platform. So again, um, I can't comment specifically, but they may be um, their insurance terms and, and, and so forth that are appropriate for the customer to retain. And, and they, that would potentially change if they change platform. So again, it's another consideration between advisor and customer. I'm sorry, when you say the insurance arrangements might change, I'm just not sure I understand what that means. So typically through platforms you can access insurance. Um, some of the older platforms, it's, they're group insurance arrangements, and some of the more contemporary platforms, it's individual retail insurance. Um, so potentially some of these clients maybe ha have insurance attached to their account or associated with the platform account, um, and that would change if they moved to another platform that has a different uh, insurance provider. Sorry, what would, I'm not sure I follow what the disadvantage would be to the client. They would be moving out of one insurance policy and right. set of terms and conditions and premiums, and that would change to another insurance provider on a different platform. So, uh, and again, could result in a change in terms of coverage and premiums. But they could move even to another AMP platform? They could, and there would be differences in insurance, for instance. I see. And for portfolio care services, we can see that as at 2013, there were almost 20,000 clients invested through that platform? Yes, I can see that. And of that, more than 17,500 were from affiliated advisors? Yes, that's correct. And by 2017, that number had halved down to about 10,500? Yes. But about 90% of those clients were from affiliated advisors? Yes, and the portfolio care platforms predominantly are used by the Hillross licensee. So again, they would be Hillross advisors in that case. And has Hillross sought from your team a list of the advisors that still have clients invested through the portfolio care services platform? No. To your knowledge, has it done that at any time during the period 2013 to 2017? Not that I'm aware of. And similarly, in relation to AMP financial planning, has it at any time between 2013 and 2017 sort a list of the advisors that still have clients invested through Wealthview? Not that I'm aware of. Right. And does Wealthview offer in specie transfer to other platforms? I'm not sure of the answer there, I'd have to check. And what about portfolio care services? I think the answer is no, but again, I would need to, to check the, the product disclosure documents. Is there any reason why Wealthview, or I'm sorry, why your team couldn't reduce the cost of the Wealth, Wealthview platform to make it competitive with other platforms? Uh, that's certainly an option. Is there any reason why it hasn't done that? Nothing uh, specifically, no. And did your team have access to these benchmarking results in 2013? Um, not, that, not that I'm aware of, so probably the earliest that, I, that I'm aware of is probably 2015 and onwards. All right, so in 2000, from about 2015, your team had access to these benchmarking results? Uh, certainly in terms of having conversation or dialogue with the research team to ask about, to inform us of where the products have um, appeared in terms of the benchmarking results and ask the product team in terms of um, plans around pricing and product development and so forth. And has there been any discussion within your team as to the possibility of trying to make the Wealthview platform competitive on price? Uh, yes, there has been, yes. Is that a recent discussion? Uh, probably in the same time frame around 2015, 2016. And a decision was made not to do that? The decision was made to uh, we repriced the portfolio care ERAP 
product, which is the most contemporary of the products on the list that I can see there. Yes. But the decision was made not to reprice uh, the portfolio care service or portfolio or elements or wealth view, the other three products listed there. And why was that decision made? What was the reason? Again, I think our focus was on the most contemporary product offering, which was in, in, in that group, the ERAP offering. But you know, or you knew as at 2015, that there were clients in these platforms and they were being charged a price uncompetitive with the market? Yes, according to the benchmarking, yes. Sorry, did you have any reason to think it wasn't uncompetitive with the market? No, sorry, right. no. So you knew that they were being charged a price uncompetitive with the market, but decided not to adjust your price? That's correct. We, we provide, there are other choices for advisors in terms of similar products to use um, with alternate pricing. And why not adjust your prices to be competitive in the market? Well, I think we, we would look at our set of products and um, typically focus on the most contemporary products in terms of, um, but again, we, we look at everything, but we, we have recently focused on the more contemporary offers in terms of pricing changes. Why did your team not feel competitive pressure to have to price two of your products at a point competitive with the market? I think based on um, when we looked at flows into the different platform products from the different um, advice groups, we were seeing um, you know, less interest or less flows going to those products and increasing flows going to some of the more contemporary offerings. Um, so that was one of the that was one of the factors. Is the point that you weren't well? The first point is you weren't seeing clients going into new clients going into portfolio care services or wealth view. Yes, that's correct. You saw them going into other products. Yes, we did. And so the products that they were going into, you wanted to make those price competitive. Uh, yes, make sure they were. But for the clients already in Wealthview or Portfolio Care Services, you just didn't have any interest in making those products price competitive? No, I think we, we just made the decision to leave them as they were um, in that case. Because the clients were already there and possibly trapped there? I wouldn't describe it as trapped, but yes, the clients were already, there were already existing clients in those products. And there might have been disadvantages to them if they tried to move to a more price competitive product? Uh, we talked earlier around, yes, what, what's involved in moving and, and yes, there, there are steps to be taken for the, for the um, client to move platforms. Now, AMP stopped doing its benchmarking in the second half of 2016. I'm unaware of that, so stopped benchmarking. Well, the latest benchmarking pro document that you have produced is October 2016. Yes, I believe that's the most recent um, benchmarking guideline document. And until that point in time, from 1 July 2013 until October 2016, AMP had produced what appear to be nine versions of the benchmarking guide there's you understand why i say that which is october 2016 is version 8.1 yes so amp appears to have produced nine benchmarking guides between 1 july 2013 and october 2016 yes that's correct and are you aware of why it hasn't produced any further benchmarking guide for amp financial planning after that point in time no i'm not oh. So whether the position of the AMP products has improved or worsened is something you're unaware of? That's right, that's the most recent document I've seen. And similarly, as far as you know, the financial planners operating in AMP's network would be unaware of whether AMP's products have improved or 
got worse in price competitiveness in the last year and a half? Yeah, I can't answer that. I'm not, I'm not sure. All right. Now, I want to move to another topic, Mr Keating, and that is to understand some things about the fees and commissions that NMN, NMMT Limited pays and receives. So if we can just be clear about this, NMMT Limited is the company within the, RAP, within the AMP group that operates its RAP platforms? Yes, that's correct. And there's also another company that operates the superannuation RAP platforms? Uh, NM Super is one of the, for instance, one of the superannuation trustees who right. then um, outsource the platform operation to NMMT that you refer to. If a fund is going to appear to be a, is going to be available through an AMP platform, then it's necessary for that fund to be on AMP's approved products and services list. Yes, that's correct. And in respect of some of the funds managers, they have agreements with M NMMT Limited that they will pay amounts of money to NMMT Limited? Uh, yes, that's the case, and some of those arrangements are pre-2013. I understand. And is it necessary for a fund manager to have an arrangement with NMMT Limited to pay money to NMMT Limited in order for the fund to appear on one of the platforms operated by AMP? No, it's not. All right. So of the fund managers that are offering platforms, I'm sorry, are offering funds through AMP's platforms, what percentage of them would not be paying any fee to AMP, I'm sorry, to NMMT Limited? I don't know the answer to that, I'm sorry. All right, are you able to approximate it for the Commission? No, I know, I've, I've certainly provided my statement that the five top five fund managers in terms of amounts paid to NMMT. Um, right would, now, I, I, couldn't, I wouldn't estimate that. Can but, your voice speak up, please? What did you say? So I'd say, I said, uh, Commissioner, that uh, in my statement, um, I've indicated the fund managers, the top five fund managers in terms of payments they make to NMMT, um, but I'm not in a position to estimate um, what percentage of existing fund managers make payments to NMMT overall. Not able to give an approximation? No, I'm not. <clears throat> and a paragraph 89, subparagraph A of your statement you refer to something called the Comprehensive Manager Reporting Fee? Yes, I do. This is a fee paid to NMMT by fund managers? Yes, it is. And is it a fixed amount? Uh, yes, it is. And do you know what the fixed amount is? I believe it's $25,000 per annum. Per fund or per fund manager? I'm not sure of the answer to that. All right. And that's a fee that's payable by a fund manager to NMMT for what you describe as monthly reporting and statistics? Yes, that's correct. And is that a fee that's only payable if the fund has entered into an arrangement after 1 July 2013? Yes, that's correct. And do funds that entered into, a, of, I'm sorry, fund managers that entered into arrangements before 1 July 2013 also get access to monthly reporting and monthly platform statistics? Yes, they do. Do they also need to enter into one of these arrangements to pay a comprehensive manager reporting fee to get access to that information? I believe so, yes. Okay. So this is a fee 
that would effectively be paid by any fund manager that wants to get access to this reporting information? Yes, that's correct. And the arrangements, though, would only be something that's entered into after 1 July 2013? Is yes, right? for the comprehensive manager reporting, that's correct. And is that on the basis that this is a reasonable fee for a service provided by NMMT to the fund manager? Yes, I believe it is. And therefore it fits within one of the grandfathering exceptions in the FOFA legislation. Is that your understanding? So I can just repeat that question. And so therefore, on the basis that it's a reasonable fee for a service provided to the funds manager, it fits within one of the grandfathering exceptions. I'm sorry, it fits within one of the exceptions under the FOFA legislation. Yes, that's correct. And then the second type of fee that you talk about in 89B is a fund manager's administration fee. And you, yes, des it is, yeah. you describe that as a fee payable by the funds manager for the distribution of their managed investment scheme on the platform pursuant to what you say are long-standing contractual arrangements entered into prior to 1 July 2013? Yes, that's correct. And so this is a fee payable on the basis that it fits within the grandfathering exception under FOFA because the arrangement was already in place before FOFA came into operation? Yes. And I want to just understand some aspects of that. You've picked out the top five fund managers that are paying you these fees as of 1 January 2018. That's at the effectively page 21 of your statement. Yes, I have. And so in each of those, in respect of each of those fund managers, they had already entered into some sort of contractual arrangement with, a, with NMMT before 1 July 2013? Yes, that's correct. And the contractual arrangement would be that the fund manager would pay to NMMT, NMMT some percentage of the total value of the funds invested in a particular fund through AMP platforms, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And would the percentage vary depending upon which fund of the fund managers was under consideration? Yes, I believe there was some variation. And so, for example, to take Perpetual, which is the fifth highest amount, Perpetual might offer a number of funds that are available through AMP's platforms? Yes. And the number of basis points on the total funds under management through AMP's platform that would be paid might in some cases be 10 basis points, in other cases 15 basis points? Yes, that's correct. If a fund manager adds a new fund to, or is allowed to add a new fund, for availability through an AMP platform after the 1st of July 2013, will they also be expected or would they pay any percentage of the funds under management for that new fund? No, they would not. All right, so the policy of AMP is the grandfathering arrangements only apply to funds where there was already, to specific funds where there was already a contractual arrangement before 1 July 2013. Yes, that's correct. But for funds that fall within that category, that is, they were already subject to an arrangement before 1 July 2013, does the number of basis points paid every, ever vary? Uh, after 1 July 2013? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I believe right. it's stayed the same. But if a new client entered into an AMP platform in, say, 2016, and part of their monies were invested in a fund that had been subject to an arrangement before 1 July 2013, the fund manager would have to pay 
some number of basis points to AMP for that new monies? I don't believe so. Um, I think any new monies post 2013 is not part of that. Pay. Oh, I see. Is that a is that some variation that's been done to the AMP contracts? I'm not sure. I, All right. We do have um, copies of the agreements in the, in the statement. Is there some technological system that performs this calculation? Yeah, I'm, there is. I'm not sure exactly what system that is. All right. Why would a fund manager before 1 July 2013 have agreed to pay some number of basis points to NMMT for investments through AMP's platforms? I believe it was for access to distribution of their, of their investment products. Well, does that mean they wouldn't be able to get access to distribution unless they paid the fee? No, I don't think that was the case. So if they could get access to distribution without paying the fee, why would they pay the fee? I'm not sure of the answer. It's obviously a, a commercial <coughs> conversation between uh, AMP and the fund manager in terms of that arrangement. You are not involved in those no, negotiations? No, I'm not involved in any of those negotiations. And then at 89C, you talk about fund manager rebates? Yes, I do, yep. And do they fall into <coughs> the same category as fund manager administration fees? Yes, they do. That is, it only applies for arrangements that were entered into before 1 July 2013? Yes, that's correct. And also, if new funds are made available by a particular fund manager after 1 July 2013, there wouldn't be a rebate payable by that fund manager for the new fund? That's correct, yes. All right. And then in 90A of your statement, you explain key partner program payments? Yes, I do. Can you just well, you identify key partner program payments. Can you just explain to the Commissioner what those are? Um, that's an agreement between the fund managers and AMP advice licensees, um, where a payment is made to be by the fund manager to the licensee to be part of the key partner program. Um, and, that, and that's to have access to and participate in professional development forums for advisors. Um, so effectively the opportunity to engage with advisors about their investment products. I see, the fund managers pay money to an AMP licensee in order to be able to have access to the authorised representatives of that licensee? Yes, that's correct. And can I also ask then about something that's not addressed in your statement for good reason because we hadn't asked you any questions about it. But this is about platform payments by the platform operator to advice licensees. You've referred to one type of payment that is made by platform operators to advice licensees, which is remitting the member service fee or advice fee. Are there other types of payments that are made by NMMT to advice licensees? Not that I'm aware of, no. All right. Were, before 1 July 2013, were there such payments? Again, okay, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions for Mr Keating. Thank you. Is, does any party having leave to appear other than uh, AMP seek leave to cross-examine? No. Mr Hollow? Thank you. Uh, Mr Keating, you gave some evidence uh, this morning that in certain circumstances um, advisors could seek exemptions to use a uh, platform product not on, not on the uh, approved product list. Yes, that's that? correct. And if I could ask you to go to paragraphs 86 to 87 of your statement. I 
I think you deal with the circumstances there. Is that right? Yes, I do, in paragraph 86. Um, and then in paragraph 87, you indicate uh, that in certain circumstances, advisers are not required to seek that approval. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Can I ask you this? Um, do you know uh, how many applications were made to use um, uh, RAP plat platforms uh, or, and master trusts or investments made through them that were not on the approved product list in the last quarter of 2017? Yes, I'm, I'm aware that there were approximately 1,050 um, requests from advisors <coughs> to the research team in that regard that were approved. Sorry, could you break that down for us? Uh, how many, do you know how many applications? I believe it was approximately 1,200 And how many, sorry, and how many of those were approved? 1,050 approximately. Thank you. Um, and you made reference to um, investments uh, that were made through RAP platforms. Um, are those investments, um, do those investments include products um, uh, that aren't issued by any AMP entities? Sorry, can, can you just repeat that question? Yes. Um, you said that um, uh, you a answered my last question on the basis um, that um, I will withdraw that. Um, you understand, don't you, that investments of various kinds can be made through RAP platforms and master trusts? Yes, I do. My question is, um, uh, those investments that could be made through uh, RAP platforms and master trusts that are on the APLs include um, both uh, products uh, issued by AMP entities and those that are not? Yes, that's correct. Um, and where would those products, where, where, where would those products be found or listed? Uh, they, are, they are on the investment menu for each of those platform products. So as part of the disclosure documents, there's a, an investment options document which sets those out. Uh, you're referring to a product disclosure statement and um, another document? Uh, yes, that's correct. An What's the other document? Associated document in relation to investment options for that product. Thank you. Um, you also um, were asked some questions about caps on um, advice fees. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And you gave some fairly specific answers in respect, I think, of the Minorth wrap product. <coughs> yes, I did. Um, um, where um, was that information, from where was that information obtained? Uh, it's available in the product disclosure document, which is publicly available and uh, is part of what a, a customer receives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hollow. Is there anything arising, Mr Hodge? No, thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> thank you very much, Mr Keating. You may step down. You're excused. Attendance. Now, Mr Hodge, where to from here? Commissioner, can we just adjourn for five minutes so that we can rearrange? Yes, what's the next? M Ms Elkins, who is a witness from CBA. Yes, so changing of the guard at the bar yes. table. Well, if I come back at, uh, what, half past 11? Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs>